parents, what do we owe them? This episode is inspired by questions from our listeners who noticed that their relationship with parents reflect on their relationship with work colleagues due to learned behaviours. And it's Ewan and Mike. Welcome to The Imperfect Clinician. Have you been influenced by parents? Definitely, yes. I think parents are one of the major influences on children. They, they've got multiple functions, I guess. They have, they are an authority when you're much younger. They are a source of knowledge and inspiration because what we see, we learn and we desperately want to be them. And I think when we arrive in our teen years, we start to develop our own voice that can often be suppressed by parents. So I wonder when you were younger, does so your parents trust your choices? And if they do or they don't, how does it change you now? Does it mold you? Yeah, that's very true that when you're a child, uh, you the only thing you know is the parents or guardians, you know, whoever's looking after you. Sometimes it's somebody who may not be directly directed with you. It could be a stepdad, stepfamily in general. Grandparents. Grandparents. Whoever is there right next to you is Foster the biggest family. authority for you. Yeah. And I remember, I think we went for a swimming lesson and one of the teachers said, it doesn't matter how you sing. As a parent, you always be the best singer for your child. Yeah, okay. So at least keep trying, keep going. And I think that was something that made me realize that actually the power over children is absolutely huge. And mm -hmm. how you portray yourself, and nobody's perfect. I mean, we all make mistakes. We all have our lives that we make weird choices or, you know, or things that our children see that are not perfect or sometimes things just happen and they have to, they have no, nothing else to compare. The comparison starts later at school, probably, where they are exposed to others over a prolonged period of time. And I think that in my case, I think it's a story of two tales in general, because my mom approached the things a little bit different than my dad. But I think at these early ages, my parents were more guiding rather than forbidding okay. in that respect. Okay? Not so, dictating. So not, not dictating, although uh, there were the rules that were set had to be obeyed. Okay? Boundaries. Was, yeah, the boundaries. You know, there were some, I think, safety nets. Sometimes that were due to the obvious danger that the kid can go into, but sometimes they were because how things are supposed to be. And you, I think at early ages, you are taught not to question the parents. And then when you get a little bit older, you start to develop your own brain because you start to develop some sort of experiences and you've seen your peers, you've seen other children, you've been exposed to a bit wider world and all of a sudden you start to question those uh, some of the decisions of your parents they still are your authority in a way and the point of reference um, more than anything i mean i now being a grown-up will dispute the fact whether you need authority in general whether you can be an authority for yourself but uh, then I would like to say that your parents are the point of reference. It's like, I don't know, you cook, your mom cooks a soup at home and you're always going to recognize its smell. And you go to somebody else's home and they're going to make the same soup, but the smell is going to be different. So you, your point of reference is your forming years of your childhood and your early youth. So... You said your parents trust your choices, or partially. 
Would you say one parent does and one parent not as much? And you, do you have to switch between two different environments? No, I think, I don't know. It, it depends a bit on uh, the setting, I guess. At home, I think we spend most of the time with my mom, especially after my parents divorced. Obviously, that was uh, where we came back home and that's where our home where we slept was. Mm. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? I, I spent a lot of time with... Uh, with my dad later on uh, when we were, were working together or, you know, in, in a business life in general, we just spent a lot of time with, uh, I did spend a lot of time with my dad. But at home, my mom was setting the rules. I think she was quite understanding and quite trusted our judgments. Uh, we, I think she was trying to agree things with us, with me and my sister, and... I don't think she appreciated when we were trying to bend those rules. And she thought that if we agree to the rules, we should stick to it. So yeah. come in, depending on the time when we agreed to come back home, depending on the time when we were uh, agreed to do homework. And I wasn't a disobedient child, not by any means. I think that started in my adult life, <laughs> maybe a bit <laughs> before that. But I think that in my early years, I was quite calm and uneventful young man and how about yourself i think for me it's a yes and no when you say whether the my parents trust my choices so i started with you can't you have to listen to me because i am more experienced or there is a saying that I eat more salt than you eat rice so you have to listen to me because i've done i've done my time in life but then there are this switches to you are the oldest of the siblings so you have to take on extra responsibilities and it's not a two way street so it's not a as the eldest one you take care of your younger siblings but the younger siblings don't have to take care of the older sibling so it it's more because you've been put in that position There's as greater the, expectations yes. from the older i was the oldest as well so that's and, similar and so it was quite i guess confusing for me when i was younger when i have to make that switch to why do i have to listen to you all the time even though you've gone through it, it's not the same experience as me. But also, when you put in that box, when your role in the family is defined, she's the eldest, she knows what to do, she knows all of the answer, we don't have to worry about her. In does, some, not, does not leave you a little bit more freedom? In some cases, more freedom, but also it makes it harder for me to break that role that's defined for me mm. so it makes it harder for me to ask the questions if i'm worried it makes it hard to show i guess weakness because i am the eldest so i have to i have to know it i have to be able to lead i have to be responsible i cannot not be because that's the role of the eldest and so i find it very hard to break that mole and can find it quite suffocating at times because I didn't know how to communicate that across. Okay, so based on early years, I was thinking because now we have children and they are very young and on your experience, what do you think that do, should we make an effort in or allow our children to make more independent decisions of course within the safety boundaries and the safety netting around it but should we put more choices for our children to do quite early on so they get experience in making choices in order for me to answer that question then i would like to understand because you were given that choice when you were growing up did it help with your decision making process now did it give you more practice? I, I don't know about practice, but what I'm uh, pretty sure is that quite early on you start to develop your own brain. You 
uh, start to assess events around you independently within the remit of what you are as a child. And because the thing is, as a young child, well, you can't leave the child completely with the consequences of their choices because very often they're not resilient enough. They don't have the resilience that, uh, late, that you gain later on in life through your experience. Mm-hmm. So I think that you should encourage decisions as young as possible, I think. I think that it allows them to create their own idea of things that they like, but also idea of things that can benefit them, can be also considered as, for example, kind, if they see that there is approval to the decision by others, so the impact on others is positive, I think they're more likely to remember that. If you take this decision process away from your children, then you're risking that they're not going to develop their own way of assessing the world. Yeah, I think and... it's it's simple things, even like, you know, to put the right clothes. I mean, who are we to decide what they might feel comfortable in? It doesn't really impact us for our pleasure just to make sure that the child wears what we want them to wear. If we want them to wear to choose from what they wear, we buy them clothes and they have to pick amongst those. But let them pick what they like. Then I think what you mentioned about freedom earlier on for me, I think for me it benefited in my risk assessment skills because I was given in some ways opportunities to make mistakes and fall. I was able to have that confidence to to look at things around me and think, right, what's going to be best for me? Mm. But there are also situations where, because I'm in my teens, my brain's not working greatly because it's still forming, so hormones take over and I don't make great decisions, but I also get to learn from it. So I think having the freedom or the space actually helps me to grow because I am going into uncharted territories without someone who is micromanaging or constantly trying to hover. I agree. And I think that we started doing something with our children. When we started, it was a bit of a jump start during pandemics because there was no opportunity for them to use that skill. But then we restarted it um, a while ago. We give our little kids a pound a week to for them to spend on whatever they like. They can save up. They can, you know, we explain how the money work, roughly, okay, that you have to pay for things that you some things are dearer than others and sometimes you have to make an effort in order to save up for something bigger or you can do whatever you like with it and we're just now observing how they are learning from that piece of independence because we do not interfere on how they spend they want to spend it on sweets fair enough they're not going to get any sweets from us we if they want to spend it on toys, books, whatever, it's entirely up to them. And I think this is the beginning of making independent decision. I think there's also one more thing. We don't condition this salary or weekly wages on the performance. This is something for them that is independent from anything else. This is for them to start to organize their or planning of the finances quite early in the um, in the childhood. And then I hope that it's going to benefit them in that respect that they'll be able to make more conscious and savvy decisions later on when they have got more money to spend. You know, they will understand the consequence of it. If you buy yourself sweets, you can't buy something else. And I think that this is this is quite important to, to understand. So based on the decisions that we as parents want to take on our children's behalf. I think we all and all parents want happiness for the children and all parents think they know how to get it. I think 
To some extent, but I feel, based on observation, a lot of these are driven by fears from parents, whether it's some level of risk aversion or pain avoidance. So I wanted to take this opportunity to ask you, not just Mike, but you, the listener, how are you now as an adult in dealing with your own fear and pain? And how much of those are learnt behaviours? And if you have any learnt behaviours or you've made efforts to do it differently, share in the comments below. Yeah, I think that there is one more thing, one more aspect of uh, parenting and they're affecting the children is to that there is a risk of unfulfilled parents' opportunities, that is, talking through their actions to, I don't know, convince, order, let children to follow their dreams, that the parents' dreams, and that feels like they like spoon-feeding them to children. So, right, you have to go to that house, you have to go to become a doctor or a solicitor or whatever, and e they you look this rational head that this is going to benefit you in the future because even if you don't enjoy it you're still going to have a decent life it's just the fear then of either losing out whether it's a hobby that they couldn't pursue so they want their child or children to do so or the career that they think that's going to provide a safety yeah to do uh, to to have a decent life so that's the risk aversion that's that we risk aversion, that mentioned yeah. previously because as parents, you want minimal risk to your child just to make sure that they thrive better than you were. So I think it's only fair to say that in adulthood, we continue to strive to fulfill the desires that we developed in childhood. So what should we be grateful for and for our parents? And what do we know we can do better? I think. Well, it is a very individual uh, question, and I, I want to say that I quite early decided on what you, what I want to do in life, and it wasn't really affected by my parent. I mean, pharmacies was a family business, and I decided that I want to be a pharmacist. Not, I want to believe. I'm le leading myself to believe that it wasn't a decision. It, it wasn't a family decision because I decided to become a pharmacist much earlier. I came across a genuinely amazing uh, tutor who told me a few things about the pharmacy world and how exciting it was. And I think I owe to him that I made quite early a decision to become a pharmacist before there was a time for parents to influence it. Because usually this influencing starts around mid high school i want to say i'm going to so put yeah, a point the, on it mid high school so the timing's quite important then in your case because the interference or the chatter around you didn't start until after you've made your decision so yeah and i i think that this was of course i think it was in line with what my parents thought would be good for me because obviously it was a family business and all that so they didn't have to do it and I think it was quite a um, relief for them, in a way, that I want to pursue something that would be a good thing to do in the future and it's going to be in line with the family business. I mean, the world turned itself upside down. I went, I decided to move to a different country and there were some other decisions that happened since then. But I think that by being exposed to other people, not necessarily only your parents, by being shown another example, that has a great impact. I think it's it's a bit like with an impact of music. Our music tastes are formed when we are 13, 14 years old. And that sort of hardly ever, for majority of people, hardly ever shifts to something different. And this is the time when if you start making decisions for yourself and you are supported in that, because I was very lucky because it was in line with my parents' uh, idea, I think 
I was supported with it, but I can see and I speak to a lot of clinicians and a lot of grown-ups, adults, that did it to please their parents, to, well, follow the brain rather than the feelings. You know, they wanted to play trombone, but they decided to become a solicitor because that was safer, that was less passionate, but that's something that may affect their future life to provide them a decent life. I mean, being a trombone player, I could imagine that it can be absolutely fascinating, but may not always mean enormous success. Yeah. I mean, financial. Yeah. yeah. And how about yourself? Where, where was your mm, decision-making process affected and how was it followed through by your parents? So every time when I've made the inverted commas right decision, it has always been followed with praises and exhibition of love, whether it's verbally or physically. So then I see that it becomes, a, I perceive that as a conditional love. Yeah, Transact there is a transaction. Transactional love, or in some ways it can be performative because I get the praise after I've performed well. So I had to unlearn and relearn the definition in my head where achievement is equivalent to self-worth. So if I do well, I am better. If I don't do well, I am not worthy. That still crops up from time to time. But when I am having the practice to ensure that it's separate and not used to shaming language on myself. It's, it is helpful when I can see the distance, no matter how well I achieve, I don't know, job career wise, it still doesn't define me as a person. Similarly, if I have a very bad day, it still doesn't reflect on me as a person. Because you mentioned earlier on about the, you don't want it to see it as a reward when you mentioned about the um, money for the children. Yes. Yeah. And I think motivation or stroke reward and punishment, we've used this, or I want to say this is a, these are tools that have been used in developing people because I guess it's quicker than actually taking time to explain why you're doing it and taking time to understand why are you not on board so how are we as parents and how are we as leaders how do we empower and ultimately trust our fellow clinicians and team members instead of using the reward and the and the punishment what do you think works based on your experience i think i'm i'm not the best example of a person who would like to micromanage everything and i think leaving independence to others if you're working in a team if you're working with others you have to accept that people can make choices different to your idea of their best choice for them would be mm -hmm. and you have to suck it up i mean live with it you can guide you can mentor you can um, provide necessary data for people to make a decision and ultimately you have to work in, in the team with people who you trust to be peers, to trust to be on the same level as are you because if you are uh, feeling more important than others that creates imbalance. Now what happens when you're a leader, when you're a leader of a team or a manager then there is a greater responsibility to provide right environment and right structure for decision making, I think. And this is the responsibility of the leader. So you share the vision, you show the purpose, but you don't necessarily micromanage every single thing that is happening around you because you are working with independent people. So I think then it would be a great opportunity for us to reflect on relationships at work 
based on your upbringing. So there can be external validation. So where people are constantly people pleasing because they are so afraid of facing disappointment or... Is that because they were parents pleasing in the past? Maybe. And or their parents are people pleasers too because there is some level of conflict avoidance or risk aversion. So, so they uh, can be as an example? Yes. Okay, so think I'll either be example or they approving your decisions by, um, well, you are externally validated by your parents. Yes. And they're saying, oh yeah, that is good. So there's like a positive... Yeah, um, uh, and it's a, a trait that you take with you no matter where you go, whether it's work, whether it's social life, or the other way around, as if you don't have the people-pleasing side of it, you constantly trying to prove someone wrong so you take comments very personally i guess because it's more of the emotional regulation so how you take things personally and how you react to it okay so what is the ideal way to encourage a team then so i think exploring what individual people in the team or big teams what are their reward feedback in their brain so some people I find take praise minimally or reject it because of various factors sometimes they don't think they're worthy of the praise and whilst they're doing that they take rejection or criticism deeply so when I observe that, I am trying to adapt feedback or communication to that particular person or particular group of people. I think a lot of these can also be quite emotionally draining, especially when you are in the process of learning to set your own boundaries. So you have, it's for me, I think it's important to say what's okay and what's not okay. Okay, and where does the link between this way of feedback or, you know, managing or leading the team feed in with setting goals and targets? Because that's sort of external validation to some extent as well, reaching the target or achieving the goal. I... I prefer to do it a little bit differently. So I want to understand what drives people because if I don't, a generalized statement can be received differently. So, and I know each person will have their own different drivers, different values. And when I do this as a team activity, everyone actually have sight of what is important for each person and as a whole the team then improves understanding of each other the relationship improves and I've noticed that it really empowers them to support each other when I do that I set purpose for the team instead of I should say I set goals but then we're working towards the bigger purpose. So we have shared values and shared purpose and goals are just the steps of getting there. The goals don't define the team. So it's like uh, the money is not the ultimate prize in life. It's yes. just what you can do with the money. Exactly. Okay, okay. And I want to go back at that point because we discussed the dynamics in the team mm. and discussed the, the childhood so going back to our initial question, what do we owe the parents? In my opinion, we owe them the view of the world yeah. because we look through their lens for a very long time. Absolutely. And we should be encouraged to 
also challenge this view. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest lesson that you can get from a parent is not to teach them how to read, is to question what they read. The critical Whatever thinking. Whatever it is, to get the critical thinking. Because parents can be wrong. And I want to set the decent example for my children. And I shouldn't be... I shouldn't have thought of myself as a bad parent if the feedback from my children is negative when I'm doing something that's not really benefiting me, family or people around me. And the same thing at work, I guess, if you receive um, a negative feedback, learning to not take it personally and take it as a learning opportunity, not just for yourself, but for the whole team. Because for them to be able to have the courage to say that to you, it must mean that you've created an environment where they feel safe to bring it up. Absolutely. 100%. I think that the parents have huge impact on our lives. But do you think that you achieve things because of your parents or do you think you would have achieved more if you listened to them more or less? I think... Because that's the ultimate decision. Should we, I don't know, so far, have you trusted your parents to the degree they would say, right, I've made the right choices in life because of my parents or despite of my parents, so trying to work against my parents? Can I say both? <laughs> because it, it can be both, yeah. Because whatever that they have done, I want to say not just my parents, but all parents, speaking as a parent myself, we always do it from the best of intention. Yeah, I wouldn't and, say that we should assume bad intention in, yeah, in parents. And and I think that helps because that makes me feel grateful for what I have and what I have missed. That is my own journey to find out and to understand. Because like us, our parents have their own baggage, baggages, fears to address. And it might be that when they were having me, they were not given the time and the capacity to do that, which means it's then down to me to some extent to break the cycle. When I have the awareness and when I work on it, I'm hoping to break some part of the cycle and not pass it on, not just to my children, but to people around me. Because it's a ripple effect. It's, you can't just say how I am as a child have no impact whatsoever on me as a clinician. I think that is quite an impossible um, thing to say from my own observation. So yeah, both. I listened to them when I wanted to and a lot of the times I paved my own way. And it okay, got so me to where I am. Based on this, would you prefer to have been more challenged by your parents to challenge your decisions? Or would you prefer them to completely let go and, I wouldn't say don't care, but just fully embrace your decisions? I, I don't think that would have changed how I made that choice anyway. Okay. Because I was, when I was doing the all those decisions when my parents disagree, I was in a rebellious stage. Remember when I say I was in a box and I was mm. trying to get out, that was my way of rebelling, that I don't want to be in the box anymore. Whether you embrace it or you question it, I just don't want to be in it anymore. Based on my own experience, I think that I value independent decision and integrity in making your own decisions. I think it's a, the most important thing that everybody should have, that you have got the right knowledge, that you have knowledge to make your own decisions. But I do sometimes wonder, says, what if I listened more? What if I listened less? And mm, where I would agree. it take me? I do not regret anything that happened in my life 
But I know that there are some regrets or there were some regrets uh, for, for my dad because he always said that I'm not going to achieve anything and he would probably... He supported me to become a pharmacist because that would provide me a decent job. But based on his experience, he wanted me to get into business. Those things are not always that possible to go together at the same time because you yeah. have only limited capacity for one thing or another. So yeah. either commit to one or the other. And there are some people who are more keen to do things in business and there are some people that are more keen to become, I don't know, a professional or whatever, musician, whatever they want to be. Yeah. And I think that I could have ended up differently, but I think we have, I, I'm trying to stay very humble and I'm very happy with how things worked out and I'm very appreciative and very grateful for what's happened to me so far. I'm still alive and kicking. I have, uh, you know, beautiful family. I'm happy and I think this is, the value so no matter what route you start on with or you are you set off as long as you develop some critical thinking which should be ideally stimulated by parents and people around you but if it's not then i'm pretty sure that in life you will be challenged and you will have to make those choices at some stage that ultimately should provide you with the desired outcome or if you don't get the desired outcome, you're going to achieve the outcome that you will start to appreciate because you don't know whether it would be a happy choice for you to become more successful, for example. Yeah, I think that this is quite quite an important thing to to appreciate. And I think, you know, when I say I've accepted where where I am now and my past, it's not... I hope people don't think this is an easy process. I know some of you are still struggling to reconcile the difference, struggling to come face to face with the pain that has been inflicted and how that changed you as a person, as a clinician, as a friend. And it is going to be a difficult journey however you can always seek help you can listen to us you can speak to a therapist you can speak to a counsellor there are so many sounding boards around you as long as you take the courage to ask take the first step to come face to face with the pain and it will be worth it in the end. I'm pretty sure it would be. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that when I'm looking at my choices in life, I want to say that some of them were good, bad, and we all make mistakes in life and we have only one life. So we have to make most of them. But I want to say that most choices, all the choices that are made were the best at the time when I was making them. They led me to where I am now, but I made at the time the best choices with the information, with the world around me and the environment for me. You always try to make sure that you make the best decisions, whether they are influenced or not influenced. There's only yourself to like, to live with those. So I think it's important to be proud of what you've achieved. And that's probably the reason why I never say that I'm proud for somebody else. You know, I, I can't be proud for somebody else's achievement. You know, I can't be proud because I'm tall. I can't be proud because I'm from a certain country. I can't be proud. You know, these are the things that made up my genome. There, there's only one I have. I can be only proud with what I have achieved. And I can only be appreciative and appreciate the fact of what I have seen and done in my life. So the ultimate question this time at the pretty much end of this episode is would you have done better in life if you listened to your parents? And there is also a second ultimate question. Would you have done better in life if you have not listened to your parents? Let us know in the comments below. Have a think. Until next time. Well, 
welcome to the segment of You and Read. This is called From Scratch by Tembi Lock. Um, this is a Netflix series, so I didn't... I heard about it from Netflix, but I thought I would like to read it first before I explore watching it. Oh, and it made me cry, it made me laugh, it made me, my heart melt. It is, I haven't come across a book that made me feel so much all at the same time. And it felt quite cathartic, actually. Um, Really highlights the difference in different generation, different race different culture and the food in it oh my goodness if you're a food lover and you like to read things about food please and it talks about three different generations Tembi's daughter and then her mother-in-law and the whole culture and the grief oh I won't tell you a lot more than that, but it was the grief that made me cry. But made me cry because they had such a good thing together. And then he had cancer. So it's having a glimpse into grief of somebody and how it requires community and food to slowly let Tembi adapt because you'll never recover from grief but adapt and in doing so allowed her 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 mother-in-law and her daughter to come together cross-culturally yeah it's, it's a love story, but it's, it's enduring, definitely, especially if you need a cry. This book will do it easy peasy for you. Thank you. You just listened to the Imperfect Clinician podcast. We strongly recommend you leave your email on our website so that we can let you know directly about any news and free exclusive content for subscribers. If you review us on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser, there is a chance we can reach more people seeking support and encouragement. Reflect on how you are now and let us know about one thing you would do differently after listening to us. We love to hear from you, so please keep the questions coming via direct message, email, comment or record a voicemail on our website. We will do our best to answer you either directly or via the podcast. Bye for now and until next time. Mm